from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. My golly, I knew it. What? Yes, sir, I knew darn well you'd still be here in Vegas. Pete. That's right, Pete Brenneman. And just how did you know I was still around and here at the Stardust? Simple process of elimination. When I called the airlines, they said you hadn't bought a ticket, Johnny. Their flights were all full up. Oh, yeah? That's right. <laughs> or did you just decide to stay over and partake of some of the joys of living that Las Vegas offers? No. Nope. The only reason I'm still here is that... Well, I started calling the big hotels, and sure enough, the Stardust said you're among those present. Having yourself a gay old time, Johnny? <laughs> Losing your shirt at the gaming table? Pete, I told you, the only reason I'm still here Johnny, is that... Johnny, I hate to put a damper on your fun. Pete. But I sure am glad you did stay over. Because little problems come up. Oh? Not another murder case, I hope. Oh, just little problem. Arson, embezzlement, burglary, what? Unless you don't care about a possible extra fee on this trip, why don't you come over here to the office and let me tell you all about it? Okay. Why not? <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Las Vegas office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the zip matter. In spite of what I had said to Pete Brenneman on the phone, I was glad to have the chance for another good look at this fabulous, exciting town in the middle of the Mojave Desert. There is something almost incredible about its wide-open gambling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even the drug and candy stores groceries and gas stations are equipped with slot machines to quickly relieve you of any loose change that you might have. Parts of Fremont Street, the main drag, have one big casino after another where you can play at the roulette and crap tables, blackjack, bingo, chemin de fer, poker, baccarat, you name it. And where you can also bet on the nags at any horse track in the country. And every one of the big, fancy, glamorous hotels has its own private casino. And nightclubs where you can rub elbows with broken-down miners or famous Hollywood stars all gathered to watch the floor shows featuring the finest, best-paid entertainers in the country. I've seen men in rumpled denim shirts and faded blue jeans wager $100 bills on a single number at roulette, lose it, and walk away without a whimper. I've seen a sweet little gray-haired old lady, somebody's grandmother, win over 5000 bucks of craps and give it all back via the slot machine route or on the flip of a card at the blackjack table. As for me, well, I've lost a little want a little, and I'm thankful that gambling has never been a compulsion with me, or given me the false hope that in the long run, I could ever come out ahead. Naturally, I wondered if it had anything to do with this new case Pete Brenneman had for me. Expense account item one, a dollar even for a taxi from the Stardust to Pete's office. Here, Johnny. Here, take a look at this. Hmm. Willard Rayfield Swift. Yeah. Well, Pete, since when has your company been attaching the picture of a beneficiary to an insurance policy? Johnny, Western Maritime and Life will attach anything to a policy. Information on anything or anybody even remotely connected with the insured. Well, what about this, uh, Willard Rayfield Swift? Ever see him in the flesh? Not that I know of. Haven't you been doing any gambling over there at the Stardust? <laughs> oh, a little. Well, then you should have run into Swifty at one of the roulette wheels. Well, after all, Pete, I've only been in town a few hours. Long enough, Johnny. Long enough. That's his favorite place, and Swifty is a confirmed incurable gambler. At, uh, let's see, what's it say here? The ripe old age of 31? Yeah. Ever since his papa died about six years ago and left him a lot of dough. Hmm. Which, I suppose, didn't last very long. Oh, Papa was smart and provided that the money be dealt out to Swifty in small amounts. If you can call 300 a week, small amounts. I'd call it a real nice legacy. But he's carefully, steadily gambled away every cent of it. Yeah, and then so. You mean he's borrowed? That's exactly what I mean. And without the loaners knowing, the legacy to him is about to stop now. Ouch. Yeah, even more to the point, these loaners don't know the true facts about this policy. What do you mean, Pete? This policy is Uncle Fred's. And old Frederick Payton died only day before yesterday, leaving no estate except this insurance, $120,000 worth. 120? 
Well, that should hold your boy, Swifty, for a while. Except for one thing. Yeah? It's to be divided up three ways. Here, look at these other beneficiaries. Uh-huh. <laughs> Doreen Janice Clayford. Wow. <clears throat> Pretty name, too. A niece. Is she really as good-looking as this picture? Sure is. Where do you see her? My, my. All that beauty and all that money. Hmm. My tie straight, Penny. My hair look all right. You look gorgeous, Johnny, but you're too late. Doreen's married to a fellow with a feed store. Oh, you killed Joy. This other picture is another nephew. The other beneficiary. Kenneth Kermit. Uh-huh. Ken's the oldest one of the three. Uh, born in 1922, says here. Let's see, that makes him about 40, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. He has a little, uh, I mean, a little cattle ranch up near Glendale. Mm -hmm. That's north of here. Does some well drilling and odd jobs in his spare time. Real hard worker. Nice guy. Well, now, what about him, Pete? All three are equal beneficiaries, Johnny. Oh? 40000 apiece, then? Mm-hmm. And that's just about what I understand Swift deals. But. Yes? If one of them dies before this money is paid out, the remaining two will split 50-50. 60000 It's a big difference. It sure is, especially if a guy needs dough. And, of course, if two of them were to go, so that only one of them would be left to collect. And remember this, Johnny. Yeah. There never was any love lost between those two. I mean, between the nephews, Ken Kermer and... Willard Swift. What about the girl? Oh, she's been pretty much a part problem. You know, married and all. Those boys have always been at each other's throats. Hated each other's guts. Would even go out of their way to make trouble. Especially Swifty. You think maybe one of them would go so far as to kill the other to grab a bigger share of the insurance? Ken Kerman? Go that far? No. But Swifty? Yeah, I think he would. And Johnny? Well? If you didn't see Swifty around the tables there at the Stardust... And you would have noticed him. No, I think I wouldn't. Well, Johnny, if you ask me, that means he's up to something. And you'd better get on this right away. Well, Pete, I think you're right. When you have to stay alert, don't let drowsiness slow you down. Perk up. Perk up with no dose. The safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. Remember, when you're driving, working, studying, and monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up. Perk up with no dose. No dose. There's a second reason for not wasting any time, Johnny, one I just found out about. What's that, Pete? The fact that Shorty Callahan is breathing down Swifty's neck. Who's Callahan? The punk he owes the nearly 40000 to. Oh. And what's more, Swifty knows that if he doesn't pay off Callahan and Pronto, well, nobody can prove anything, at least nobody has yet. But it's been rumored around that people who try to welch on Callahan can end up very, very dead. Hmm, what nice people you know. I wish I didn't. Now, am I supposed to save Swifty from Callahan? Why bother? Just Ken Kermer from Swifty. Yeah. If one of Callahan's boys were to knock off Swifty, nobody complained one bit. It'd be a case of good riddance. Where did you say that Ken Kermer lives? This side of Glendale, about 45 miles north of here. Mm -hmm. Then if Swifty isn't at his usual place at the Stardust, if it turns out that he isn't even here in town. Right, Johnny. You and I'd better hop into my car and... Oh, excuse me. Brenneman. Mr. Brenneman? Yeah. Mr. Brenneman, this is Doreen Clayford. Hey, Johnny, get close. Listen to this. I'm right in. Mr. Brenneman. Yeah, go on, Doreen. Well, I'm here at the house in North Vegas. Yeah. Well, out on the highway, well, only a couple of minutes ago... Yeah. I, well, I, I met Swifty. Willard Swift, he was in a car he must have borrowed from someone. Uh-huh. Well, he was on his way up to Glendale to see Ken. You're sure about that? Yes, he told me so. And he'd been drinking. He was nasty. And he told me not to follow him, but I'm going to anyway. Now, now, wait, Doreen. No, no, I must, because... Well, don't you see? Don't you see what might happen up there? I certainly do. I mean, with Uncle Fred's insurance still to be paid and all that money he owes. Well, I told you about that. Yeah, I know. And the way Swifty feels about Ken. Well, you know yourself about how he hates him and because won't, Ken won't give him the money to pay off his debt. Yes, I know, I know. Swifty might do anything. In the mood he's in and all, the drinks he's had. Doreen... So if you want to be to get some help the police or something and, and drive up on there, will you, Mr. Brenneman? Yeah. Thank you. Now, don't, don't, don't you go, Doreen. You let me take care of... Hello? Hello? Oh, no. Johnny. 
Do you have a car handy, Pete? It's right out front. Let's go. With Pete at the wheel, we swung right at the end of Fremont Street and barreled on north on 91 toward the town of Glendale. In North Las Vegas, he stopped at a little house on one of the side streets, but only for a minute in the hope that Doreen was still there and had not gone on ahead. But apparently she had. So, out on the highway again, he really burned up the road, hoping a cop would spot us, would come along and give us a hand. But darn it, when you need him, they're never around. Well, I wouldn't say that, Pete. But look ahead. Yeah, I see. Looks like it's coming across the mountains from the east, too. If you know what these sudden easters can do in this country, Johnny... I'm afraid I do. Let's just hope we can get there ahead of it. Hang on. But about 30 miles later, the storm came with a vengeance. Believe me, it really clobbered us. And we had to slow to almost a crawl, even with the headlights on. Here and there in low spots... Rivers of mud roared across the road, and half a dozen times we passed cars with their engines drowned out. Or maybe the drivers were simply smarter than we were and decided to sit out the storm because visibility was almost nil. Now and then we had to make our way cautiously around sizable boulders that had rolled onto the road. It's just just no use, Johnny. Doreen's gotten there, gotten there way ahead of us. And you think her life might be in danger, too, hmm? You knew Swifty as well as I do. Hey, slow down and take it easy or we'll end up in a ditch. You know, you know what I wish, Johnny? What? One of Callahan's boys had taken care of Swifty. Well, who knows? Maybe that's the real reason for his heading out of Vegas. I sure hope so. But if he has gone out to Ken's ranch... Now, wait. Here's a turnoff. Thank goodness this side road is paved. Pete? Yeah, Johnny? You seem pretty sure that Ken wouldn't try to get rid of one of the others. Sure, I'm sure. Absolutely. Why? Oh, I just... I'm just sort of thinking about the whole situation, all the possibilities. And uh, Doreen? Doreen? Mm. Oh, now, Johnny. How's her husband's feed business? You know something? That poor guy's had more bad luck since he took over that... No, 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 Johnny, no. That. There's no reason in the world to suspect she might be up to... Up to what we suspect. They've been married long? Sure, a couple of years. What'd she do before then? Oh, dancer in one of the nightclubs. But now, listen, John. All right, all right. Looks uh, like the storm's letting up. Yeah, and there's Ken's ranch right ahead. There's two cars parked there. The one right next to the porch is Doreen's. Well, she got here all right. I just hope she's still all right. Isn't that Doreen standing there in the doorway? Yeah, 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 she's okay. Thank goodness. I wonder. Look. Yeah, she's waving at us kind of frantically. Come on, Johnny. Hurry! Hurry, please! What is it, Doreen? What's the matter? We got here a minute ago, Mr. Brenneman. Yeah? Swifty's car was here, and this front door was wide open, and... Yeah, well? Oh, who's this man? He's Johnny Dollar, a special investigator. Oh, thank heaven. What's happened, Doreen? Well, I, I heard a voice, shouting like he was mad, from back in there where that little door is. The door of the shop where Ken has all his well-drilling tools. Yes. Whose voice, Doreen? Oh, I don't know. They always sounded so much alike, but then, then I heard a shot. From inside the tool shop? I don't know. But when I tried that door, it was locked. And nobody answered when I called. All right, come along now. Then I heard your car coming up, so I went out to meet you. It's locked, all right. All right. Stand away now. All right. Johnny. Look, both of them. Yeah. Let's see now. Now, this one is... Um, maybe over here. Johnny? This one's not like a light. And this one is dead. theme again comes through like the taste of a Newport filter cigarette. Fresh and clear. Like the voice of a girl you used to know. Listen. There's a difference, all right. Like when you light up your first Newport. 
Man, you've never tasted anything like this. Good, rich tobacco flavor. The right amount of menthol, just a hint of cool, refreshing mint. Mm. So, what is it that fellow in the commercial says about Newport? Are there any questions, ma'am? <laughs> questions? No. I got the message. Newport's more refreshing to begin with, more refreshing all the way. Newport. The dead man was the older of the two, Ken Kerman. He'd been shot through the chest with a 38 slug, which had then bounced off the wall in back of him and lay on the floor. While Pete and Doreen, with a wet towel and some whiskey they found, went to work on the other on Swifty, I went over that tool shop with a fine-tooth comb. I looked around outside, too, and very thoroughly, but found nothing of any help. Then, when Swifty was feeling better and able to talk... And this awful lump on your head, Swifty. What happened? But what happened in here? Yeah. A lot you care, don't you, Doreen? Don't give me that. You wish it was me laying here dead. Oh. Well, I care. What did happen? Well, Swifty? Okay, okay. Give me a second to... to muster my thoughts, and I'll, I'll give it to you straight. I think you'd better. Well, I came here to... Oh! You'd better not try to move yet. I, I came here to see if there was any possibility that... Ken had let me have some money. Again, Swifty? So what? That's it to you. All right, Swifty, just tell your story. Okay, okay. At first, he didn't even want to let me out of the rain. He he blocked the door. But then he saw Doreen's car make the turn off on the highway. So he brought me in here and locked the door on us. Now, you see it? He locked it with the key. Yeah, on the inside here. Then what happened? Then we had a big argument. Brother, I mean a real big one. That's when he hit me. He didn't. Hit you with what? How do I know? Like a jerk and against my mama's best instructions, I turned my back on him. This little piece of pipe lying here beside his hand? Maybe so. Don't touch it, Pete. We may have to look for prints. Right. All right, Swifty, go on. What happened next? How should I know? Don't you get a dollar? He knocked me out. Cold as a pancake. The next thing I knew, I... This loving Doreen here was splattering water all over me just now. You didn't hear the shot that killed him? How could I? When I was laying here on the floor, out cold? Say, listen. Listen, you know what I think, darling? What? This little sweetness and light character here must have done it. What? <laughs> you mean me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean you. Oh! <laughs> Oh, and then locked the door on the outside, on the inside, and crawled out the keyhole. It's no good, Swifty. So you'd better think of a better one. Callahan, Callahan. Like maybe you did it your own self after he hit you. Wait a minute. Wait. Then maybe threw the gun out of the window. And that's why it's broken. Why the window is broken. No, wait, I said. Shorty Callahan. It had to be. One of him or one of his boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After Kenny knocked me out. Possibility, Johnny. Sure. Through the window. He must have followed me up here. In the rain and all, he thought it was me that he saw through the window. Only it wasn't. It was Ken. He could be right, Johnny. I don't think so. Well, now, look, Johnny. Yes, Pete? Well, you know what I think, much as I hate to. What? That he's right about Callahan. Sure I am. You didn't find any sign of a gun, did you? I didn't find any footprints outside either. So the storm must have washed them away. The storm was over, Pete. There was still a lot of water draining off out there. You see how the window was broken? From the outside in. All the glass is here on the floor. Broken that way by a bullet? Why not? But only have left a hole. Maybe some cracks. Oh, you're crazy, Dollar. It must have been busted by the bullet. All you had to do was raise the sash and strike it from the outside. And... Me? Oh, now listen. I think you killed him, Swifty, and for a very obvious reason. The insurance money. And I say you're crazy. Because like he says, Dollar, where's the gun? Did you find one? Inside or outside or wherever you look? Answer me that. No, I didn't. But how did you, lying here supposedly unconscious, know that I was looking around outside? Well? What are you, dumb? Because of the fresh mud all over your feet, that's how I know. 
You've got nothing on me. Mm -hmm. Not even your lie about Kermer seeing Doreen's car down at the turnoff? That's nearly half a mile, Swift, and it was raining then and raining hard. Yeah, then what about this? You think I slugged myself on the head? That's exactly what I think, so that nobody would suspect you. Then where's the gun I'm supposed to have used? Yeah, yeah, tell me that. Dig that up, and maybe somebody will believe this crazy accusation of yours. But until you find a gun, you hear me? Afraid he's right, Johnny. You bet I'm right. Or maybe you think I could have swallowed it. <laughs> maybe a zip gun that would take a thirty-eight. do Don't make me laugh. You sure you look through everything, Johnny? Zip gun. So it had to be somebody outside. Because only Kenny and me were inside here. You're sure of that? Yeah, I'm sure. I'd swear to it on a stack of Bibles. So it had to be somebody outside. Maybe Doreen here stepped out before you got here. With no mud on my shoes. So what? She got here after the storm, parked up close to the porch. No, Swifty, you did it. Without a, a minute gun. ago, you told me how. And I tell you, unless you can find a thirty-eight, but you can't. And then prove it belonged to me. A zip gun, you said. What? Here in this shop, this World River's plumbing shop is material enough for a dozen of them, a hundred of them. What do you mean, Johnny? I knew there was something wrong about this bullet that went through Kermer, and you gave me the answer, Swifty. I say you're crazy. Johnny? No marks from the rifling of a barrel on it. All right, Pete, here. Take this gun of mine and hold it on him. Sure, but I still don't get it. Well, I take a look through this stuff here, this pile of pipes. Until I find one that fits a thirty-eight. Johnny. And that still smells of gunpowder. And maybe a hammer with powder burns on it that he used to fire the cartridge. Maybe the cartridge case still in it. Then when I find Swifty's fingerprints on him and the zip gun he improvised so that nobody would find a pistol around... Well, Swifty? Watch it, Swifty. It's okay, Pete. Okay, Dollar, I'll cooperate. It won't do you any good, Swifty. It's still murder. I know, but maybe a judge would... Or a jury would... Well, anyhow, it's that short one, that hunk of steel pipe on the workbench. And the hammer beside it. <laughs> So, once again, it's up to the courts. And I'm sure that Swifty will go up for life. At the least. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford? Call it 200 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the fastest jailing of a murder suspect you ever saw. Me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Joseph Cabibbo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jim Stevens as Pete Brenneman, Leon Janney as Swifty, and Rita Lloyd as Doreen. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking.